All right. Well, while while people are logging in, I'm going to go ahead and say hello and good morning. I'm Marsha Weiss. I'm the director of the textile design programs at Thomas Jefferson University, formerly Philadelphia University and formerly Philadelphia Textile. Um, I think I've gotten in all of our more recent names. So welcome, welcome to our annual Textile Design Spring Speaker Series. We're very happy to have you with us. We know our audience includes some of our current students, both at the undergrad and graduate levels, as well as some of our alums and interested folks in the industry and possibly prospective students as well. So welcome to everybody. Um, we're very happy to have you. And um, we're very thrilled to welcome our speaker for today, Kristen Detoni, founder of Design Pool. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jen Rhodes and our assistant program director. Thanks, Marsha. Good morning, everybody. I am excited to introduce today's speaker. Um, we were just talking before the webinar started. It, uh, we date ourselves very quickly when I say I haven't seen Kristen since the 90s. Uh, I had the pleasure of working for her when we were both at Collins Naikman in North Carolina working in automotive textiles. So uh, clearly neither of us are still doing automotive as Kristen started Design Pool and I'm here on campus with our students at Jefferson. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to her. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I'm going to get to my first slide. There we go. Um, I think everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm assuming if you can't, Becky will jump in and, and uh, fix any problems. So I'm going to get started. I, it's about a 40 minute presentation, and I'm happy to take um, any questions at the end, I was just, uh, as we were chatting earlier, I'm an open book, so I'm happy to help in any way possible. Um, so when I was asked to uh, speak, um, I decided to title my presentation, Artist, Designer, Owner, Spy. So it kind of walks through my entire career. And of course, the spy, it's a, it's a well sort of. So um, you'll understand that in a little bit when we get to that point. So again, um, this is me, um, happy as can be, <laughs> doing, my, doing my thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about, as I mentioned, being an artist. So we're just going to kind of, I'm going to walk you through sort of my undergrad and grad and, and then how I got into the industry as a designer and my years spent working in textile design. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I uh, shifted from that to um, running my own business, um, first consulting and then running a business. And then um, the spy, which I'm going to leave that a little vague to pique your interest. So um, being an artist. So I am a lifelong learner. Um, I read a lot of books. I read a lot of biographies and autobiographies and just kind of anything um, that, you know, that maybe kind of can um, help me grow. So this was a book called My Year with Eleanor. And um, there's a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, which is do one thing every day that scares you. And I don't know if I do one thing every day, but I certainly do or try to do a lot of things that scare me and get me out of my comfort zone, because I think as a creative person that really helps you grow and really even as an individual as well. So this is a fun book. It was written by um, Noelle Hancock and she lost her job. And so she decided to literally do one thing every day that scared her. So um, it's kind of fun. So a little bit about me, um, I was always doing something creative. I think this might be like circa 1972 <laughs> or something with my Legos. Um, I loved architecture and you'll kind of see some of these same elements um, throughout my career, which is sort of interesting. Um, there's actually even a little Jeep that I built in the left there when John was talking about automotive. Um, and then I would take things out, as you can see, and kind of stage them. Um, and this is back in the day when film was really precious. So I appreciate that my parents would let me take a roll of film and shoot crazy photos. Um, and then um, from 1987 to 91, I did my undergrad at Kansas City Art Institute. I was uh, born and raised outside of Boston. So I decided that I wanted to kind of see the rest of the country. And I thought a good way to do that was um, through college. And then uh, after that, I was trying to get back a little more towards the East Coast and ended up um, at grad school at Cranbrook Academy of Art, both places studying fiber. And I did do my uh, undergraduate, my graduate right after my undergraduate. Um, so I did that back to back. 
So a little bit about my undergraduate. Um, as I was pulling these slides up, I'm really sorry for the quality of this, uh, the images. Again, this is before digital when you actually had to take photos. Um, but I did, um, as you know, you know, your first year you're in foundations and then the second year um, you're kind of just, I was in the fabric department just learning the basic techniques and really got interested in weaving because what I like about weaving is I love that it's a very structural um, substrate, but then my whole um, goal was to sort of get this drawn quality on it. So, and you can see again how the architecture is coming into play. So I had dealt with a lot of architecture space um, and this was all brocade um, on a, on pretty much on a plain weave. So that's what I spent my first, I would say my second year in the fiber department. Um, and again, here's just a few more images of, again, architectural spaces and trying to get this, this drawn effect. Um, and again, I apologize for the, for the images. Um, and then in, in 1990, so this would be my second to last year, I uh, really started honing in on this concept. And I also loved um, the idea of interactivity. So a way of sort of drawing the, um, the person into the art. So this was a box and as you opened it, um, so this is wood and wool and some rayon, which is the black. So as you opened it, it starts unfolding. And again, speaking to architecture, um, having this sketched image on a woven form, and then this is fully open. So um, I also love, like I said, anything that's interactive, anything that's small, anything that has to do with like a book binding, anything that's making you like open and close. Um, and at this time too, we, when I was in Kansas City going to school there, the gangs from LA, oddly enough, had just moved to Kansas City. Um, you'd think they would have been in Chicago, Chicago, more of a major city, but so it was, the campus could get a little scary at night. And this also sort of spoke to that where, you know, as you know, if you're spending uh, late nights in the studios then trying to get home, um, you know, we had a lot of cool walkways, but then would also sort of go around like dark corner. So, and then for my senior project, um, I did another woven that was also uh, foldable. And um, again, speaking to a lot of architectural spaces and also, um, you know, having that sort of dark area, but then I also, uh, watched a lot of movies. I love movies. So it's sort of capturing that snapshot of like a frame within a movie. And then from there, like I said, I went right from undergraduate to graduate school. Um, that's partly because my dad offered to pay, to be quite frank. And I was like, heck yeah, I'll take you up on that offer. Um, it also, we were just talking earlier that uh, I think the early 90s, like NAFTA was just coming into play. So that was sort of shaking up the market a little bit. And um, there weren't jobs aplenty during that time. So it seemed like a good time to go to grad school. And in grad school, I would say I was, uh, so Cranbrook is a two-year program. Um, it was challenging for me. I was hoping for sort of the same atmosphere that I had in undergrad to grad, but it was very different. So I felt a little lost. I, um, these are some drawings I did in my first year, which I think were also very, had a very woven feel to them, but I felt like I was sort of being like swept up in this tornado that I had no idea what to do with myself or what was going on. Um, cause you, you were really being forced out of your comfort zone, which I guess I should have liked after my Eleanor quote, but I wasn't quite ready to leave what I was studying in undergrad, which is more with the woven concept and the architecture. Um, but again, I did still stick with that interactivity. So I started playing a lot with like zippers and again, sort of the idea of like, you know, like if you were to sort of unzip this baseball, like what would you find inside or you know, unzip something like a fruit that, you know, you wouldn't, or a vegetable that you wouldn't necessarily think of. I mean, we kind of peel bananas, but, you know, sort of like peeling back layers and what's there. So these were just sort of like small studies on that. Um, and then that led me to, and I don't have uh, better images, which I, I probably should have, but unfortunately I don't, but my thesis was really about kind of looking at the body um, and, and the body with, um, uh, as the concept of, you know, clothing and zippers and, and hidden elements. And so I wouldn't say it was, I was super thrilled with my thesis. I think at that point I'd been in school for six years and I was just ready to get out. Um, and it was not what I was expecting. I was expecting something different. So it's funny how, when you talk to people from Cranbrook, we all have very different, um, stories, but met a lot of great people there. Um, happy I did it. It just was a lot more mentally challenging than I, than I had signed up for. So, um, so from there graduated and of course had all these student loans that I had to pay off. So I thought, okay, I need to get a job and start paying off the loans. 
Um, so another book that I read recently is called Factory Man. And there's a great quote in there that says, the real value in manufacturing is creating a community where cash flows. If the American people only realize what's taken place, they wouldn't ever buy anything from Walmart again. Um, and so I'm not knocking Walmart by any means. This book was written um, back again when Walmart was kind of coming in and sort of uh, knocking off the mom and pop stores. Um, so now we have a very different uh, scenario here with companies like Amazon. But if you're going to get into the industry, whether it be textile industry or any kind of manufacturing, um, this is, was a really interesting book because it really talked about the um, the whole process of manufacturing. And, and the thing with manufacturing too, especially in textiles, um, cash flow can be a really big thing because you're having to put so much cash up front and then you don't get paid for many months later. So um, if you kind of want to understand the industry, it's, it's a great read. So to go into my career, um, so graduated from Cranbrook and then I started my first job at Guilford Maine as a designer. Um, and at the time, which I would say is probably somewhat true, most mills are in very small towns out in the middle of nowhere. So that was a big shift going from, you know, living in some uh, cities and then kind of living out in the country. So um, this is my first portfolio. What I learned uh, pretty early on was that I had a fine art portfolio. Kansas City really trains uh, their students to have, I guess, more gallery uh, type scenarios. Um, but like I said, I had student loans that I had to pay back. And, you know, to be quite honest with myself, you know, how, how much money was I really going to make as an artist, especially a textile artist? Um, so I, I think I contacted like a local weavers guild and borrowed a loom from someone that was very kind and started doing a couple weavings that were um, kind of more applicable that might be to the industry because showing my, my art portfolio was a little overwhelming, I think, for um, the people that were interviewing me. I don't think they really knew what to do with that type of portfolio. So um, I have to say I'm a little embarrassed by this, but again, at the time it, <laughs> it was okay. Um, but I think what sold the deal for me was that, again, it was very interactive, something somebody could open, they could see the front and the back. And then I also, uh, you know, sort of drew out the peg plan so that they could see that I understood woven structures and things of that nature. And I know that she said she actually hired me because of that. Um, so my first job was designing panel systems and upholstery, and I was doing um, hand weaving for them. They had an AVL loom, and I did hand weaving for about three or four months. Um, and so back in the day, um, we would do a lot of hand weaving first to like work out the ends, the picks, the basic constructions, uh, and then go to the um, production loom. So this is, um, I did some uh, screen type weaving with some monofilament. And then oddly enough, when I was at Cranbrook, um, a friend of mine, Paula Becker, had a job at Stevens Linen and Guilford had bought Stevens Linen. So we were in the same office. So I got to do some work for her in residential. And this was um, a pleated fabric. And so the thing that I enjoyed about whether it's hand weaving or this pleated fabric on the right was they were kind of highly engineered. And um, you'll see in this next uh, career segment of mine is that I, I started really honing in on this and really love the technical aspect of design. So uh, textile design isn't always just about the image on the fabric. Um, there's so much technology behind it. So I was with Guilford Maine for about, I would say maybe about a year, a year and a half max. Um, and then as Jen mentioned, um, I went to Collins and Aikman and that's where I met Jen. So from 1994 to 2000, uh, there I started off as a designer and then became a design manager in a couple of different jobs. So essentially it was designing um, woven velours and flat wovens for automotive interiors. And I remember when I left contract, all of my friends were like, oh, automotive is so boring. You're going to hate it. Everything's bay and grayish. And yes, that's true. Everything is bay and grayish. Um, but it is so interesting because they're such highly engineered fabric. So um, I gained so much knowledge in those four years, probably more there than any other job um, that I've worked at. And it was super intense because um, the programs would only come up like every five years. It may have shifted now because I know things move a lot faster. And these were million dollar programs. So if you um, missed that opportunity, you weren't going to get it again for another five years. So not only was it very technical, but it was a very, very um, intense situation to be in kind of like the wall street of textiles, like crazy intense. So, um, and it was my first exposure to woven velours too, which was really fun. So I got to learn yet another technique, which was great and work with some woven velours. 
Um, then I moved in to become the flat woven manager. And so in this position was really fun because like I said, it was so technical. So I had, to, I had my hands in a lot of, um, of the products that were going into the car. So this was a, a Ford uni uh, universal bolster for their trucks. And again, it looks really boring because it's just a plain weave, but it's so highly engineered because it has to meet so many strict requirements. Um, think about every time you're getting in and out of your car, the stuff that you're eating in your car. I mean, we had like a ketchup test and a mustard test and a, and a mink test and all these crazy tests. So it's not just about the pattern on the fabric. It's so much about the product itself. Um, this was the Chrysler MMC Avenger. Um, and the other fun thing too is, yeah, you can see that this looks pretty plain and boring, but you don't start off this way. You start off with like the higher concept with the fun stuff. And then you sort of work your way down because by the time it gets in the car, what they say is when you're buying a car, nobody wants you to open up that door and have a reaction to anything negative in the car. So if you have like a really strong pattern and you know, pattern and color is so subjective, that's why everything's gray and beige and black. And the patterns are very neutral because they don't want anyone to have an adverse effect and say, okay, I don't want to buy this car because this fabric is hideous. Or why did you put this color in there? Um, and then the one on the right is for the Toyota Tacoma. And these were all back in the nineties. So these have all sort of uh, faded out over time. Um, another bolster, another twill. The great thing about this one and the Jeep Grand Cherokee is this was the first time we did a, what's called a stretch flat woven. And so flat wovens, um, essentially wovens, but we called it that to differentiate them from woven velours, which were pile products, um, were also different from knits. So Collins and Aikman offered all three knits, velours and pile and piles. So we were sort of all competing against each other um, for some of the car interiors. Um, and then on top of that, because knits inherently have stretch and stretch was so important and typically wovens are not inherently stretched. So again, all about the technology. So we worked with the yarn supplier that there was this yarn and when the yarn had no stretch, but when it saw heat is when it had stretch and recovery. So the way the yarn was textured allowed the fabric to have stretch and recovery. So just super cool. And then also learned a lot about, you know, solution dyed yarns and over dyeing. Of course, we did a lot of piece dye because they were solid colors. So got to learn a lot about that. Um, and then from there, I moved into um, an advanced development manager. And so uh, that was super fun because that then got to combine all the creative with all the technical. So I got to work with, uh, you know, yarns that had just been created from yarn suppliers and then figure out how to get them into products. So in this case, these were novelty yarns, which you typically couldn't um, weave in a woven velour, but using them as the back and then the pile protected them um, was kind of a fun and inter interesting um, way of using those yarns. And then I improved my portfolio, as you can see. So I switched from white, everything went to black because I think white gets dirty kind of fast. Again, it's still interactive. So this was something for my portfolio um, showing one of the products that I did and had the, the CAD graphic on the left and then the uh, woven fabric on the right. And then um, kind of my claim to fame there was um, I did receive a patent with a colleague of mine for a suspension seat. Um, the, the Aaron chair had just come to fruition from Herman Miller. That was creating a huge buzz. Everyone wanted that kind of chair. And so um, automotive as well. And so, but the, the problem was people, they were afraid if somebody looked in the car and saw a very thin chair that it wouldn't be perceived as com comfortable. And so what they did was, or what we did was I, well, a double cloth is not new, so the, the actual cloth itself, but it used an elastomeric fiber, again, the technology, um, on the bottom for the suspension part, and that would support the weight of a person while it was stretched on the chair. It's the same type of yarn they use in the Aaron chair. And then on the top, it's just a regular fabric, so that would add the comfort. And then because of the way it was developed with the channels, we then found a... Um, a foam supplier that could actually pour the foam in a semi liquid, but semi expanded form to then fill the, fill the channels. And then that could be made into the seat. So, um, so not only were we working with like GM Ford Chrysler, but we also got to work with the seat manufacturers like JCI and Lear. So there were a lot of different layers. So you, like I said, I, I learned so much in those four years from finishing fabrics to yarns to technology. So a great, um, great education just a little intense. So after I left there, 
Um, I actually went back to Guilford, Maine. Again, at this point, you start meeting people within your career. So what had happened was one of my old bosses from Guilford, uh, from Collins and Aikman had gone to Guilford, Maine. So she hired me. And when I sort of went back into the world of office interiors, I kind of was like, oh my God, like what is wrong? Like I actually had room to breathe. It wasn't that intense 24 seven, you know, we have to get this business kind of thing. So it was sort of nice to kind of get out of that automotive environment. Um, so back to designing panel systems and upholstery. Uh, and there I was a special projects manager. So I feel like that's the title they give people when they don't know what to do with you. So they, they know they wanted me there, but they just couldn't figure out what to do with me. I ended up working on some quality systems for them because um, I just come out of, out of automotive and did a lot there. Um, but because of all my I guess, sort of textile engineering background from my automotive days, I ended up sort of falling in the role to helping products um, meet all the standards. So this was the first uh, sustainable upholstery fabric that was sold to Design Text, which was, I think, at the time then owned by Steelcase. So it was sold through Steelcase and Design Text. Um, and so, you know, I didn't des um, design the fabric in the sense that this is, I mean, it's just a stripe, so there's not much to design, but it was the engineered part. So it was making sure the weaves were tight enough, there was enough picks or enough ends. Um, you know, we, at that point, we were using recycled content. Um, and then we also took away um, the back coating. And so coating was super essential to fabrics at that point, because it helped stabilize it, it helped with abrasion, help with so many things. And by taking that away, we had to figure out, we had to figure out how to engineer the fabric so that it could uh, stand alone without the coating because the coating was not sustainable. Um, so from there, uh, I got married and I married a textile chemist. So we were in the same industry. Um, so that could be a little sketch, especially in an industry that's a little volatile, but he uh, got a job with Victor and Novatex and I was all set to move to Canada and just hang out and do some artwork. And when they found out that I was a designer as well, and they were looking to get into upholstery, they hired me. So um, I went back into, well, stayed, I guess, into office contract, uh, working strictly for upholstery. Um, the fun thing about that is while I was there, again, I think because a lot of my development background, um, they started getting into some circular knits. So we partnered with an external mill in the US because at the time um, the company we worked for was uh, Canadian based. So we were living in Quebec, um, which was a really fun opportunity. And so this fabric was sold um, to Knoll and then this fabric here um, was sold to Carnegie. And this uses a fun knit to knit yarn. That's why it's so textural. So they actually knit the yarn and then they set it and then they unknit the yarn and then they wind it and then they re-knit it. <laughs> so um, not a cheap yarn, but a very cool yarn. And then finally from there, um, I actually went back to Guilford, Maine, but at that point they'd been purchased by Interface, Interface Carpet. So we became Interface Fabrics. So I was there from 2005 to 2013. Um, and they hired me first to start up their automotive division. So I did that for a few years and then um, worked in the New York office. And then from there, uh, they needed a director of design, the previous person I'd left. And I'd kind of been around enough and I thought, okay, I know all the problems. So I'm really just gonna jump in in this position to help solve the problems. But then that gave me more um, opportunities to work in healthcare and hospitality and office again. And then uh, eventually became uh, over design and development. Um, so by the time I left, I, I had quite a few people under me and you probably could see I jumped in and out of management throughout my career because management's very different from design. When you're, de when you're in management, you're not necessarily designing or have the time to design. Um, so I worked, um, with Ford and we were very strategic because it was just me and one salesperson, uh, doing their automotive. So, but we were the first to have a recycled product in the 2007 Ford Escape hybrid. And again, I think, you know, this is everything that I had done sort of led me up to this point in my career, not much design there as well, just a fun little, uh, textured weave. And it had a lot to do with how the um, fabric was constructed. Um, so just to kind of go through everything that I've been, uh, so you can sort of see how the industry has shifted over, gosh, maybe that was like 23 years. So I, like I said, I started at Guilford and Maine, and while I was there, Guilford and Maine bought Toltec. Then I went to Collins and Aikman, and Collins and Aikman owned Mastercraft, and Mastercraft was their home furnishings division Then and contract. And then from there, like I said, I went back to Guilford. At that point, Guilford had bought Intech, Technet, and Chatham. Um, then Victor and Novatex, then Interface, um, Interface Carpet, then, then sold off Interface Fabrics, which then became True Textiles. Um, and then Duvaltex, which actually was in Victor and Novatex, then became Duvaltex. 
Um, but Victor at the time had bought Quaker, which they bought it and then essentially um, dissolved it. That was unfortunate. And then Collins and Aikman got with Joan Automotive. Joan Automotive owned Main Street. That was their home, home furnishings division. So Collins and Aikman bought Joan Automotive. Main Street bought Mastercraft. Millikan's always there and they're still going strong. But Millikan sold off their auto automotive divisions to Sage Automotive. And then I don't even have all the mills, but then there are all these other mills that are there too. And with all the buying and selling, oh, and lastly, Devaltex ended up buying True. Um, and none of these mills exist anymore with all the lovely X's on them, um, which is super unfortunate. So just to give you an idea, not to be a, a bit of a Debbie Downer, but um, since 1997, over 662 mills have shut down. So because of that, um, I uh, decided in 2013 that I kind of had enough. Um, and so uh, another great quote from this awesome book that I read recently called The Fabric of Civilization. Um, they, being textiles, are everywhere. It seems intuitive, obvious, so woven into the fabric of our lives that we take it for granted. And I would say my experiences um, for the companies I worked for, design was very much taken for granted. And also, um, I just sort of got textiles in general taken for granted. This is a really interesting read because, again, we use textiles so much. And I think because we use them so much, we just exactly that, take them for granted, don't pay attention to them. But there's so much that goes into them. Um, so again, great read. So in 2013, I started a business, uh, more of a consulting business. I had a business partner. So it was a colleague that I worked with at True Textiles. Um, the great thing about that was that I was not necessarily just at the mill anymore. Um, I was in between. So I just want to give you a basic background of how the business works. So you're at the mill and you're there designing and that's manufacturing. So there's designers at the mill and then you have your jobbers. So that's your Maharams and your Archons and your momentums. Um, these are the people that buy in bulk from the mill and then they cut and sell the fabric in smaller yardage. From there, they sell to the OEMs, um, which are your original equipment manufacturers, um, but they're your Herman Millers, your steel case. So again, anyone that's sort of manufacturing the final product. So the OEMs are working some cases directly with the mill and some cases with the jobbers. Then their customers, so the jobber and OEM work with the A&D, which is architects and designers, and they're the ones specifying what materials are going to go into that space. So be it an office, a hotel, healthcare, et cetera. Um, then from there, they have the actual consumer and or customer. So the thing that I struggled with is I was way back here and I'm trying to please this person here and I had no contact with them whatsoever. Um, I also struggled with the fact that a lot of times we'd be working with consultants who had no design um, capabilities, even sometimes not even drawing capabilities, but we would be doing all the work and then they would be getting all the credit. And not to say that I'm not a credit hog by any means, but it just got frustrating, um, you know, because you work so hard at things and then it was like you were so far in the back. So in starting um, Pattern Pod, we, we kind of took a step, um, a little step closer, not, not too close, but, you know, uh, towards working with the jobbers. So in the consulting business, we worked with um, directly with the jobbers with a, maybe one, one or two OEMs. Um, and then we got to work with mills. So the fun thing is we got to work with some of our old colleagues and then people that we hadn't, uh, weren't able to work with in the past because we were competitors. So it was really fun to, uh, to be in that position. So I say consulting versus owning a business, which I'm just going to say entrepreneur, because consulting really is the business of giving expert advice to other professionals, typically in financial and business matters. So that's what we're doing. I mean, we were designing, but essentially we were giving, we were consulting with design. Um, entrepreneur and slash company is a person who organizes and operates a business or businesses taking on greater than normal financial risks in order to do so. So it really has to do with the financial part. Um, when you're consulting, you don't have a lot of overhead. It's usually just you, your computer, you can work out of your house, you may not have employees. Um, so you're not taking a lot of financial risk and it's great. It's a great business model because you, know, you can be your own boss and run your own business, um, but you don't necessarily have something to sell off at the end. So when you retire, you're sort of just probably gonna um, dissolve your business because the business is you. Um, but if you're going to go into consulting, um, obviously you need to get noticed. So you can do that with like resumes, websites, marketing, and PR. Um, you'll need to know your rates. So you want to have like a price list, you know, be ready to negotiate. Um, you can charge early versus flat rate. You can do a development fee and a royalty, or you can do a royalty only. And I'm happy to take questions about any of this at the end. Um, 
Also make sure you have a contract in place. So you might need a client contract or they may provide a contract or you might, you might have your own contract. Um, and then, um, you know, you can get these through website search templates and also use companies like LegalZoom. Also, if you're interested, um, we did a blog for ITNH, which is at the bottom, which um, talks a lot about licensing if you want to license your designs and how you can go about that. And like I said, I'll also answer questions to that. The nice thing about consulting is um, for me, kind of being out of the corporate culture and, and on my own was I really got involved in a lot with like the financials and the contracts and the negotiating and the sales and the marketing and the legal. and um, it's so funny because I was working in the industry for 23 years and not that I thought I knew it all, but I thought I knew a lot. And when I got out and started my own business, I was like, wow, I really don't know anything. <laughs> like there was so, there's so much to it. Um, but the nice thing about it is it gave me more creative freedom. Um, but for me, um, I really wanted a business to sell. So like I said, when you're a consultant, you don't sometimes necessarily have a business to sell unless maybe you're selling your book of business. Um, the other thing I got to do, which was fun, was color development. So I worked with this company, StyleX, and got to develop uh, their, their plastic colors for them. So again, learning something new, getting out of my comfort zone. And we started getting into digital printing. And this is my ultimate passion because I'm an avid DIYer. I've worked with like Spoonflower and and Shutterfly and Zazzle. And as I watched the whole DIY community um, really uh, come to fruition, I got really excited about it. And uh, this is really why I started Design Pool. So in 2019, I started Design Pool. So it was a bit of a bummer to kind of have to, after five years having some momentum, kind of start all over again. But this has really been my passion um, and really where I see the future going. So Design Pool is an online licensable library. And again, I'm just going to throw up this business model. I'm not going to go through it, but this is where design pool is now. So it gets me a lot closer to the A and D and gives me even a lot more creative freedom because I'm no longer, again, you know, necessarily trying to please these people who are then trying to please these people or then please these people. Like I'm kind of right here. So, um, so with that, another quote, starting a company is like eating glass and staring into the abyss of death. And that's an Elon Musk quote from this Chaos Monkeys. And that's a little dramatic, but at times it does feel like that because, um, you know, you're responsible for your own finances. And I have, you know, people helping me, whether it's a full-time employee or people that you're paying um, consultants. So um, it's, a, it's a very different mindset. Um, and I am hopefully growing something to sell it one day. That's my plan. So the other thing, the other great quote I like is if your idea is any good, it won't get stolen. You'll have to jam it down people's, yeah, jam it down people's throats instead. Um, also from Chaos Monkeys. And I feel like I'm living that day to day um, because what I'm doing is such a new concept to interior designers. Um, it used to be that they worked off an inventory based model, but no longer is that everything can be printed on demand, which is such a different mindset. So they don't have to buy off the shelf. They can come to my site, pick a pattern and then go from there. So again, we're an image library. So think of us as like the Shutterstock for commercial and residential interiors. We have over 600 designs and growing. Um, everything's in seamless repeat and vector format. And then we offer both licensing and proprietary options where people can buy the design outright. And then we offer custom coloring and custom design. Um, so here's just a quick video. There's no sound to this. So I'm just going to walk you through it. Here's the homepage. Um, we broke things up into categories. So if you had a new interior designer into a market, if they're unsure as to like what product might fit in that market, we show very quickly how it works. As simple as like pick your pattern, pick your product, get a sample. Um, we partnered with printers because again, the concept's so new. We figured if they came to our site, and they were like, okay, this is a great design. Now, what do I do with it? So um, we helped sort of bridge that gap for interior designers. Um, and of course I started all this during COVID. So worst time possible. So it's been a bit of a struggle. I'm um, trying to get in front of people, but each of the designs come in um, five colorways. And you can see I mapped them onto two different products. Um, and then we have icons on the right where um, that's where they can request the sample and that connects them directly to the printer. So um, we also have, like I said, proprietary designs, and that's where it is password protected because people are buying designs there. And so if they're buying them, they want to make sure that the whole world hasn't seen them. You can check out our events page, which things are kind of loading slowly in this video. Um, and then we have great blogs. And I say that, and that's because I'm not writing them. Kristen Crane is writing them. She is um, an alumni of the school, of your school. So um She's awesome, an amazing writer, and also uh, was in the textile industry too. So it was a perfect fit for us to um, work together. So 
Like I said, um, everything is print on demand now for commercial interiors. You can print on almost every surface in every market. So healthcare, hospitality, office, home furnishings, indoor and outdoor. So you can see how the designs can easily fit in any space. So this is something, my whole thing right now with design flow is education, education, education. So it's kind of jamming it down people's throats. So, um, but, and you can imagine, like I said, during COVID, it's been really challenging because I can't, it's hard to get in front of people and everyone's zoomed out. So I appreciate you even being on this call. So because of COVID in 2020, um, I had a lot of my friends that were still in the industry lose their jobs, which was super unfortunate. Um, and so one of my friends joined me for a little bit. And fortunately, she's gainfully employed again back in the textile world. But we took a lot of our designs that were on design pool and um, started an online store. So now I'm even closer to the consumer. Um, so it's called Domanda Design, which is an Italian word, I think for ask, I should know this being Italian, but, um, but just so you know, if you build it doesn't mean they will come because according to Permission Marketing, and I read this book, I, was, I would have to say at least it's five years old. So at last count, there were nearly 2 million different commercial websites. That means there are 25 people online for every single site. So I would suspect now we're lucky if there's two people online for every single site. So again, once you build it, you have to market the heck out of it. And that can mean a lot of money and or time. Um, so the great thing about it is it's all print on demand and it's drop ship. So I don't do anything. Nothing, again, is pre-made. There's no inventory. Uh, I'm not manufacturing any of it. I'm just, I'm just the homepage and the awesome designs hopefully awesome. Um, it utilizes, like I said, the licensable designs from Design Pool. Um, here's a quick video on that. And I'm not going to spend too much time. But like I said, none of this is made. It's all through Shopify. I use Printify. There's tons of other dropship companies out there. Um, Printify works with a lot of other uh, printers. So really, they're just the API. Um, they don't even make anything either. They're just the middleman. So um, if you're interested in opening up an online store, you the most time consuming thing is the design part and setting up your designs. But once you have your designs, it's all mapped for you. Um, like I said, you really don't do anything other than manage your site and hopefully manage your sales. So uh, to the spy part. Um, so like I said, I'm an avid reader. So I guess in 2019 or 2020, I read this book called The Woman Who Smashed Codes. Um, like I said, I like to read a lot of biographies. And uh, so this is Elizabeth Friedman, which um, the story is about her. And as I was reading this book, this quote that said, she liked to say that codes are all around us. In children's report, report cards, in slang, in headlines, in movies, and songs, code breaking is about noticing and manipulating patterns. And when I saw that about like, okay, my whole life has been spent designing in patterns, like how cool would that be if I did a collection of patterns that looked like regular patterns, but had all these cool hidden messages in them. Um, so, uh, with that, when, uh, we, when, so let's see, last year, the show started opening up. So Neocon, which is a big trade show is usually in June. They pushed it to October. So, uh, I developed the cryptology collection and there's me with Elizabeth, um, who is the inspiration for this. And Jason, Fago I think it's Fagone is how you pronounce his last name who wrote the book. Um, I have to give him a shout out. So here's a video I'm going to play that explains a little bit about, um, the first collection, which is, um, knowledge is power. Code makers and code breakers both know you don't need to speak the same language or any language at all to communicate a message. You just need to look for the pattern. Knowledge is power was the favorite phrase of code breaking pioneer Elizabeth Smith Friedman. During World War I, Prohibition, and World War II, she broke thousands of codes. Her work thwarted enemy bombings, brought down mob bosses, and helped defeat the Nazis. She did this all with only a paper and pencil, all for less pay than the men she supervised, and all by looking for patterns. Introducing Knowledge is Power, an upholstery collection designed by Kristen DeToni for Design Pool, available through LDI Interiors. In each design, a message is written in code. Then, that code was used to create shapes, and finally, the shapes come together to form a pattern. Does pattern have the power to communicate in our interiors? Perhaps a mood or a memory. 
This collection begins with Pattern Riverbank, a modern pattern using a barcode to create a smart, tossed floral. Pattern Frequency uses a circle cipher developed by Kristen exclusively for this collection. The colorful geometric pattern of shapes sits on a textured ground. Pattern in Depth uses the circle cipher again, this time in a clean circle pattern full of color and texture. Folio references the work Elizabeth did deciphering Shakespeare's manuscripts. It uses Morse code to create a sophisticated all-over texture. Pen to Paper, reminiscent of the way Elizabeth wrote code, uses the Rosicrucian cipher to create a smart, geometric pattern with a balance of lines and shapes. Design Pool partnered with New Hampshire-based LDI Interiors to digitally print these designs on Enviro Leather, their luxurious leather-like line of wipeable coated fabrics. This fabric uses an innovative technology in performance coatings and formulations and is leading the movement towards sustainable, high-performance, less toxic fabrics. Design Pool, a new way of doing business. With over 600 designs, we make customization easy. Pick your pattern, pick your color, pick your product, Get your sample, order production. Knowledge is Power, a collaboration between Design Pool and LDI Interiors. Okay, so um, like I said, I, I did that collection for Neocon. Here's our booth. So again, when you're owning a company, um, especially when you're a startup and I'm, I'm self-funding this business. Um, so this is, uh, you're really working on a budget, which I guess working in textiles was good because I felt like we never had money in textiles. So I'm really good at working on a budget. Um, but you know, that actually the video itself, uh, I actually ended up doing the whole video too. So you really end up expanding, um, your skill set to incorporate a lot of different skills when you have your own business. So, uh, as the video said, this is knowledge is power. And these are the patterns that are in there, folio, pencil to paper, riverbank, um, frequency and in-depth. Um, so I won't go through every single one of them um, since you just heard the video on those. We did a second collection um, in that whole grouping called Top Secret, and this was the flooring collection. And this paid homage to um, the women who broke code in World War II. So after I read the, um, the book, The Woman Who Smashed Codes, I then read um, the book from Liza Mundy, which was, oh gosh, now I'm blanking on the name, but uh, at least I remember the author. Anyways, it was all about the, the women in World War II, code girls that broke code in World War II. So I decided to pay homage to them. So, and even the names like Bird, Science, Five Languages, Railroad, Daisy Chain, um, they're all clues to what these are about. And so um, the, the second one in Science, that's actually when you decode it, um, says, um, it's Bill Nye, the sciences guy's mother, actually broke code in World War II, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Jenkins Nye. So if you decode this, that's what that comes up to. So all these um, are hidden names um, for five of the women that broke code. And then we did a collection called Radio Waves, and this was printed on acoustical materials. Um, that one's called Message, Traffic to Jetty. So I actually took my name and made that a code because I was also trying to figure out creatively like how to name all these patterns. So it was like a code name for a code fabric, um, signals, and then telegraph. And then the last one we did was a wall carbon collection called Classified. Um, and uh, this one's called Ciphertext, Key and Code code and then decipher. So I got crazy with the design. Some of them were super easy. You can see this is like a barcode. This is um, called the pig pen cipher. This is the Rosicrucian cipher. So I started doing a lot of research on different codes and different ciphers. And then I really started put, so these, these kind of look like code here, but then I started really pushing the limits with some of the designs. Um, Cause in this one on the right, the code is actually in the outline of the flowers. Um, and then there's, there's also code in the back. So I took those five women's name and then created a code out of that. So it's like code within code. Um, same thing here is this is um, Morse code. And then, I, and then I created a pattern out of the Morse code. And then I cut that into the shape. So to decipher these would take a lot of work. 
Um, but again, I just love the idea that even after I'm gone, like if these patterns are still out in the world, that maybe someone, you know, 500 years from now might find these patterns and start decoding them and sort of see what was going on. So, um, and so that's pretty much my career up to date. Um, I, I work about, which is probably, you wouldn't think that it's possible to work a 90 hour work week, but it is when you're working nights and weekends. Um, I wouldn't say that I do that all the time. That's not very sustainable, but um, it also depends on, you know, your goals and what you're going for. And in my downtime, um, I like to do a lot of artwork still. And, and just recently I've sort of started getting into the gallery. So this is actually another coded piece um, that I did um, called um, Elizabeth. Um, and then this, just a few pieces, I've started getting into natural dyeing and really just having fun. They're only eight by eight. So I try and keep things small, things that are manageable for me because I don't have a ton of free time. Um, and then I want to just share some resources for you. So one thing I always, well, I had to kind of learn and then, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. So now I just try and, you know, share that knowledge. So there's lots of places up there that you can use. Um, so, you know, creative market, if you're looking to map something, yeah, I can do it in Photoshop, but it was easier in the beginning just to, you know, uh, buy something and use that or, you know, someone to do, to do my logo design. Yeah. I could probably have done it on my own, but like, I'm not going to be the best at it. And there's 99 designs out there, um, to find people to do it for me. As far as design tools, I'm sure you're familiar with Adobe, but I was still used to working with programs that came with the, um, you know, within the software. So once I left the industry, I couldn't afford a $20,000, $25,000 CAD software for textiles. So I actually had to learn a whole new skill set, um, you know, at age, you know, 35, 40, um, which was fine because it's good. It's always good to learn new things. Um, Spider's great for calibration, uh, inexpensive way to calibrate your screen. Shutterstock's another great resource for design tools. If you're looking for color tools and building up color palettes, you know, uh, paint stores are, are great. Etsy's good because sometimes you can find people that sell little swatch cards. Same things on eBay. I found like, I couldn't afford new Pantone, bo Pantone books, but I found some older ones on eBay um, that I could afford. And then, um, as far as um, other tools go, we have Vistaprint and Moo and SmartPress and Zazzle if you're looking to, you know, maybe like send someone a pen with your name on it. Um, Shutterfly is great. Blurb is great for if you're doing like books or magazines. Flipsnack is good. Anything sticker wise. Um, MailChimp is great for all your um, newsletters. And then Loomly and Hootsuite are good for your social media to schedule those. Um, business management tools from a project management state, uh, standpoint, Basecamp's one that they use a lot. Um, Insightly is another one. I think that's more uh, for sales. Dropbox, which you're probably all familiar with, that's become really popular. Also, we transfer um, to transfer large files. Um, Airtable and then Asana is also a great platform for scheduling. And again, a lot of these things are good if you're on a budget because for the smaller versions, they're free. And then hopefully by the time you're making some money is when you can get into the, the paid versions. Um, financial, I know you hear a lot of QuickBooks, but FreshBooks is not, not super new anymore, but they're great. Customer service is great. And they're a lot less, a lot, a lot less cheaper than um, QuickBooks is. It's super important to have good photos. Um, it is a big investment. Getting a professional photographer isn't cheap. Um, there's Kristen Crane, an alumni, um, in one of our photos for um, the Cryptology collection shoot and another Kristen who's the photographer. So we had three Kristens in one room, which was really fun. So like I said, hire a photographer. Also Peer Space, I just recently discovered them. So I rented the space in Amesbury, Mass for like $70. It's probably a little more expensive than you in cities, but if you're looking for a cool space, like people are putting up their spaces more and more. Um, for photo shoots and it ranges all over the place. So um, from pricing, even to location to look and then Thumbtack and Upwork is a good place too to, um, to find people. And then just a little inspiration. Like I said, I read a lot. So here's just some fun books that are great um, from a creative standpoint. Also, if you're going to get into business, I highly recommend this financial intelligence for entrepreneurs because it does talk about cash flow and things of that nature. And then I love this quote that it took me 10 years to become an overnight success because you always think you hear of someone and you, you know, you think it happened for them overnight, but it really doesn't. I mean, you're pretty rare if it does. And then join organizations. There's some um, lots of great ones out there, whether you're in like uh, textiles, like Act is Good, Color Marketing Group, I IDA is for interior designers. ISCC is a color, uh, more technical color, but they're fun. Um, Chamber of Commerce, if you're starting a new business, that can be a great resource to get your name out there. Um, AATCC is a, another technical for textiles. ASID is an um, interior design one. SGIA is one for graphics. Um, or start your own group. I mean, a lot of these do have some hefty 
um, fees to join. So it may not be something you want to do off the bat. Sometimes there are some good Facebook groups that can be free, um, although they can also be challenging, um, but you can always start your own. And then I always say continue to explore, which I do a lot. So I found this great company, Ace Camps. Um, it's kind of like adult summer camp for creatives. Um, so I took like a block printing class in Portugal and I actually learned the um, needle punch technique at this great little air, um, great little b and in uh, Scotland. And then there's this other organization, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but you essentially, it's like apprenticing with an artist and they're all over the US and all over the world. And there's different times and different prices. So check it out, they're a cool resource. And then I just mentioned italki because again, I'm like trying to learn Italian. So like I said, I'm a lifelong learner. So always trying to, you know, expand my horizons. And then uh, residencies are another good way to, um, to get some time. I also highly recommend, recommend volunteering um, to donate your time and or money or both. If you can afford it, it's always good karma. This was a project I did with Building on Hope when I moved to New Hampshire. I didn't know anyone. I went to a, a conference with the Chamber of Commerce and then she put me onto this. Um, so I helped redo their lobby, which was fun because usually I'm not the interior designer, I'm just the designer. So, and then a crazy me had it in my head that I should take their logo and do a giant mosaic for them, which was something like, I don't know, 60,000 little tiles that I ended up gluing and cutting. Um, but I think if you're a weaver, you would understand that. We love things that take lots of time. Also just want to mention live in the moment. So I know everyone loves to be on their iPhones and taking photos for social media, but you know, it's, it's good just to put your phone down and experience the moment. Um, when I was at Cranbrook, I was um, able to, a lot of times I picked up the visiting artist and I once picked up Jacqueline R. Larson from the airport when he was a visiting artist and I asked him what's the best advice you can give and he said be a bowl, be receptive to everything. So I, I always think that's great advice. And then lastly, just leave you with this last quote that thoughts have consequences so great that they create your reality. So really, it's just about, you know, there's going to be days, whether it's, you know, you're, it's at school or your job or, you know, whatever challenging you're facing. Yes, it's going to stink at times. And yeah, it's going to, you know, maybe not be the best, but, you know, just pick up yourself and keep going because I've learned to be very, very resilient working in textiles and then starting my own business. Um, and I have some resources so I can share it with the group um, for them. Uh, if you guys want the PDF, I'll send it to you because it has kind of everything we talked about from like reading books and then a lot if you were looking to consult or start your own business. And then here's just some fun follow me stuff. And then lastly, um, I hope everyone's as happy as these lovely little minions. Um, thanks for your time. And if you have your, I just said, don't take out your phone, but now you can take out your phone if you want, but you can also sign up for our trend letter on, um, on our website. So, so I have so many questions and just a little bit of time. I know uh, I'm sorry. All, I should have talked faster. Yeah. Kristen, that was amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. Such so much inspiration. And thank you for sharing your career with us. Um, a couple of questions that have been shared are, so you, you mentioned that you had 600 plus designs. Could you speak just a little bit about where, where do you get color and trend information from? Like, do, are there sources you're looking at? Is it if you could talk a little bit about that part of your process, please. Yeah, so I actually attended a, a talk once when I was in New York City. Um, I can't remember who was, who was giving it, but they talked about trends and like where they get their trend research. And, you know, it kind of comes from everywhere. Like it comes from the movie industry. Um, makeup, she said, was a really good one because uh, fashion is very fashion forward or, you know, makeups along with fashion. Runways, which has really shifted over the years, but runways are another good one. Um, you know, there used to be some good to, some good websites to go to. Um, I'm trying to think or like blogs like Design Milk. So even just going out and like walking through stores, which I know was hard during COVID. So it's really just about sort of like paying attention to what's even in politics, like what's happening in politics or what's happening with the economy, because everything's interconnected and everything plays off itself. So one thing I love doing and, and it uh, so if you watch the runway shows, and it's like the runway shows then trickle into home furnishings. And then from home furnishings, it would go into contract. So like office, no, actually, no, sorry. Then hospitality, because hospitalities and hotels were pretty, again, a little more edgy. So I'm trying to think it was resident, uh, home furnishings, hospitality, 
contract office, maybe hospitals. And then it was like automotive was down here. So like when you look at the runway, you see like vibrant colors and like fluorescence, you know, maybe like fluorescent green. And then by the time you get to automotive, it was like, oh, it's a gray green. So it was really fun to kind of like watch to see like how things shift. Um, and then even, you know, with what's in influencing fashion, it has so much to do with, like I said, the economy and politics. And so, um, yeah, so I just sort of try and keep my eyes and ears open to everything. Um, but I have to say now, because I'm so busy with just all the running the business that Kristen um, Crane, who, like I said, is an alumni, she she helps me with all that now. So I have to give her credit. <laughs> it's clear that that your curiosity is a is a big part of what keeps driving you forward. Um, and, and that's really fantastic and amazing. How important. So another question that we've received, how important is it that you do you feel is it that you had the industry experience before starting your own business yeah that's a good question so um i mean i don't know if you need to have industry experience before starting your own business um i do think you should have a, a either whether you're going through somebody like score um which is an organization that uh partners you with mentors which i actually even have mentors through them even after all the industry business um, and, or if you work with like SBA, like your local small business association, cause all that stuff is free, which is great. So I think for me, I don't know if I would have done it. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have had the confidence to just go out and sort of, you know, pave the way for myself back then. And it's a very different world we live in now. It's so much easier with technology and, you know, LinkedIn and you have access to so many things. I always say I was like born too late or too early. I'm not quite sure which, um, but you know, there's plenty of people that, that start right from out of school. I think the only thing that you might have a hard time with is that nobody knows you. And so it's hard enough that people know, knew me and I'm still having to like, prove myself because I was at the mill and I wasn't, you know, at a job or at a, at an OEM. Um, and you don't, if you don't have a name or you don't have like 50,000 followers on Instagram, um, you know, it's, it's so weird how people, uh, want to classify you as to like what, you know, and what you don't know and whether they decide to work with you. And that's where I think that quote about, you know, it took me 10 years to become an overnight success, you know, cause you hear of people and you think, well, Oh my God, like, how did they, you know, like they were a painter and now they're selling, you know, pillows at Target. Like, how did that happen? And um, so, and that's another reason why I read biographies. Like there's great, great books, like, you know, Shoe Dog about the guy who started Nike. And so I think it's, again, like, I think if you read things like that, like learn from other people's mistakes, figure out how other people kind of got from point A to point B, um, I think would be really helpful, but there's kind of people doing it both ways. So I don't, I mean, for me, it was good. And like I said, even after the 23 years, I thought I knew so much more. And then, then I started the business and I was like, oh my God, like, gee. so. Well, and, and that, I think that ties back into both a couple of things that you've said, which is like, you've shared such amazing resources with us and with our audience that, about not reinventing the wheel and also that need to get out in front of people, which, so the, the great opportunity is we all have access to so much now through social media. The challenge is we all have access to so much through social media. It's that sort of double-edged sword. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would almost recommend um, staying off of social media if you can, because for me, it, um, there's so much talent out there and, you know, you're trying to separate yourself from the pack or at least offer something unique. And it can get really, like, you can get really down really fast when you start getting on and you're like, why does this person have 2 million followers? And I have like 900 and why does, you know, and so, um, I just, you know, my, my, the best advice I can give you is put your blinders on, you know, get a, get a, have a good plan, have a good business plan, have some good people on your side that you can tap into. You know, if you have a question or you need advice and then just put your blinders on and go and just, you know, if you're really full on, just keep going full on until you, you know, see what, see what you have, what you want to have come to fruition. You might have to pivot. Things might change. You're got, you know, COVID's going to happen. You're going to have lots of curveballs. Um, so you have to be, you know, I think we we're talking about earlier, like being flexible, um, to pivot and things like that, but yeah, just, you can't, it's, 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 it's hard. So I, social media is good and bad. Yeah. Well, Kristen, thank you so, so much. What a brilliant kickoff to our spring speaker series. Um, Kristen, thank you so much. And you have an open invitation to visit us on campus whenever that suits your schedule. 
So I know we, we talked love- about it. Thank you. Cause semester. Semester. Yeah, I know. We, well, we want to do it when the weather's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Um, again, our, our great thanks to Kristen and to all of our attendees. Again, our great thanks and thanks. Um, all the best. Take care. Thanks. Bye.